Welcome to this fourth meeting on where is South Africa heading after the elections. It's a long time since we had a discussion, a proper discussion on South Africa. And uh, I'm so surprised that there are so few others who have uh, arranged meetings during the spring. Uh, a lot of things are happening in Southern Africa, in South Africa. And uh, now we had the elections uh, just a week ago or two weeks ago. And uh, of course, it's very interesting what's going to happen. The world is in turmoil. Many countries in Africa also uh, are meeting a lot of problems. South Africa has been our hope for quite some time. There has been some ups and downs in that hope, and that's what we are going to discuss today. I mean, the, we are not going to be very sophisticated. We are not going to give you any exact details on the elections. We are not. Uh, we are going to have a discussion here with a few people who are engaged in South Africa, and uh, we'll see where we will where this will take us. <coughs> this is a collaboration between Nordic Africa Institute and uh, Threning for Utvecklings Studio FUF. So, very welcome. We'll start by asking Fiona. Uh, no, we ask by asking you all to present yourself. I, I think it's better. And a little more than, than just a few words. This. Good evening. My name is Fiona Rowley. I'm currently the Executive Director at International Idea. But I'm here because I used to be the chief deputy chief electoral officer responsible for corporate services at the Electoral Commission in South Africa. So my understanding of the electoral process in South Africa is relatively detailed and granular, starting with the constitution and working its way down to the practical realities of the logistics of delivering an election in the circumstances that we faced. Thank you. Thank you. Henning? My name is Henning Melba. Good evening. Uh, the short version is I'm a German-born Namibian living in Sweden. Okay. What it means I came to Namibia as a teenager, considered it as my home, joined Swapo 45 years ago. I'm still a member of uh, the former liberation movement, now government. Um, not very much liked by my comrades, but uh, they haven't kicked me out. And I came to, uh, from Namibia to Sweden in 2000 as the fourth chef for the Nordiska Afrika Institute and was then uh, the executive director of the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation and now I'm back at the Nordic Africa Institute. Lisa? Thank you. My name is uh, Lisa Laxo. I'm a senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute. Um, my current project concerns uh, political uh, transformations in Africa, also from the point of view of uh, academic freedom and uh, political science discipline knowledge. But uh, I have done previously most of my field work in Zimbabwe, and uh, I have also worked on elections and electoral politics in general in Africa. I, I started now my, my current research project uh, only in January, but uh, I have to say that this spring has been quite exciting time in African politics, as is it also in, in Europe and, and uh, elsewhere in the world. So a lot is happening in that area. And finally, Magnus. Uh, my name is Magnus Wallan. I work at the uh, Diakonia as a senior policy advisor, but my history is basically with the uh, anti-apartheid movement. Uh, and during 10 years' time, I was traveling on and off to South Africa, also during a couple of years when uh, ANC was banned in the, in the uh, 80s. Um, so I've been following uh, South Africa um, Although that I'm not an academic, uh, uh, but just following it of interest. He's an activist. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's start by asking Fiona. You were uh, in South Africa during elections. Can you give us a picture of the elections? 
from a technical point of view? Sure. Um, and I, I must say, on a, on a personal note, before I talk about the elections, that I used to say to colleagues that you can take a girl out of the elections business, but you can't take the elections business out of a girl. There is nothing quite like the adrenaline rush and the, the, the sense of, of, of pride you get in delivering a successful free and fair election, particularly in a context like South Africa where people for so long didn't have a voice. So to be part of that process for so long was for me um, personally very, very rewarding. Um, in South Africa, the, the electoral process begins at the Constitution. And again, maybe I'm partisan here, but I think the South African Constitution is an excellent document that enshrines the rights of all citizens. Um, and then there are three or four key pieces of law that underpin that. Um, there's the Electoral Act, the Municipal Electoral Act, and the Municipal Demarcation Act. Um, that regulate the, the setting of boundaries. The first point of any elections process is reference to the law. And one of the things we took very, very seriously at the Electoral Commission was absolute compliance to the law. Then, um, in more practical terms, the delivery of an election is actually a monstrous and exceptionally complex logistical exercise. When I was there, we were talking about delivering uh, a bill of materials, and unlike here in Sweden where um, I voted in the European elections um, on Sunday for the first time, and I've never seen ballot papers like the Swedish ballot papers before, where you pick a, pick a party and put it in an envelope. The, the um, elections in South Africa, the ballot paper is a, a, a listing of parties where you would make a, a mark next to your selected party. And uh, we also treat those ballot papers as if they are gold. They are very, very heavily secured at all stages of the process to prevent ballot stuffing and to ensure the integrity of the process. There are special security features that are top secret that mean that you can't, even if you do manage to get hold of a copy, you, uh, you, uh, you can't copy it. Um, and all of these are top secret, but if we were to pick up a ballot paper that was a fraud, there are things that we could look for. We say, this is not a real ballot paper. There are also um, security stamps, so when you get your uh, name crossed off on the voters' roll and you have to vote in your registered voting district or ward now by presenting your ID book, um, there's a stamp that needs to be stamped on the back of the ballot paper, and that also has a number of security features contained within it, so we know that if it's a valid ballot paper, it must be the right ballot paper with that stamp. Now, this is a um, a heavily secured operation where we track the progress of all these security items from inception to return um, to ensure that there's no manipulation or mismanagement within that process. And we're talking about delivering these materials. In the case of a, a national and provincial election like the one just <coughs> passed, you're talking about... Um, that ballot papers for the province and for the National Assembly, it's one thing. In a municipal ballot, uh, in a municipal election, which happens every second year after the uh, national and provincial election, you're then talking about a different ballot paper for every ward, potentially, because there's ward candidates as well. So making sure that the right ballot paper gets to the right voting station um, at the right time so that we can open 22,610 voting stations when I was there is a significant chart, uh, task. And it used to annoy me so much when I was there and I listened on the radio to people saying, oh, well, this ballot, uh, this uh, voting station didn't open at 7 o'clock or this one didn't have uh, whatever, pens or something. What, what were these people doing for five years that they couldn't get this right? And I'm like, do you know what it's like to get 22,610 different packs to the right place at 7 o'clock in the morning? Or in fact, in some cases, our staff, and we employed 210,000 people um, that we uh, 
had to contract, that we had to train, that we had to deploy to those uh, voting stations, somebody's going to get lost. Somebody is going to have had a row with his or her uh, uh, spouse or partner the night before and as a consequence oversleep because they didn't get to bed on time. Somebody's going to have a tummy ache. Something <laughs> that you, you, you can't realistically expect all of those things to operate smoothly. It's just not a realistic prospect. But the fact that we managed to repeatedly do it with such high levels of success is a testament to those people that work in that institution still and deliver this. And if you look at this year, was it as good as when you were there? I think so. I think so. There were challenges and there will remain challenges going forward. Um, one of the things is, of course, that uh, as the country experiences uh, a restriction in its, its growth and its available fiscal resources, the money available for elections is under increasing pressure. <coughs> and the high levels of contestation mean that the costs are potentially going up. There were about a million more people on the voters' roll this year than there were in the previous election. So that means you have to have equipment and facilities for potentially a million more people to vote. Although turnout was lower, you can't, when you go into the election plan for a low turnout, you have to ensure that you have the equipment and the ballot papers for everybody. And there were 48 people on the ballot, as uh, 48 parties on the ballot as well. So previously, maybe you had to print a ballot of this length. Now it was, it was a fairly substantive document. But in general terms, my impression was that the excitement was still there, the processes were still working, and definitively the staff were still as committed because they know, each and every one of them knows, that no matter what, and in every institution, you have maybe little arguments with your colleagues or whatever, but when you're in the elections business, you know that you can't allow those things to get in the way of your primary motivation for going to work and delivering the result that you need to deliver. And ultimately, um, the election was pronounced free and fair. Um, the the voting turn, turnout, you said it had gone down. This yes, time. it was 74-ish um, percent in the last round of elections, 65-ish in the most recent round of elections. Part of that is a function of the fact that the voters' roll had increased, but overall the number of people who turned out was lower. Can you just end by giving the account of the outcome of the election also? Broadly speaking, the, uh, the ANC uh, is still the ruling party in South Africa, although with a slightly reduced majority. I think their majority reduced from 68% to about 58%, uh, 60, it was about 65%, 66% to about 57.5%. The DA also lost a little bit of, of share, um, but the, uh, the EFF gained a little bit. There were a number of very small parties on the ballot, uh, and a lot of them would have lost their deposits. Because in South Africa, in order to contest an election, you have to pay a deposit, and if you don't get a certain share of the vote, you lose your deposit. And a number of them would have done. And that share is how much? I think it's 5%. You're testing my memory now. Okay, okay thank you very much. Let, uh, Lisa, can you... you, you comment on this and also give yes. it in, in African perspective? Yes, uh, thank you. I think that uh, this uh, uh, explanation of the practical arrangement of the elections was, uh, was indeed uh, very important because that kind of practical issues are something that many African countries are struggling with. And, uh, and I think that the significance of the, of the South African electoral, electoral policy is that uh, indeed since 94 all the elections have been regarded as free and fair. And uh, when we have seen now elections from, uh, well, uh, starting from Zimbabwe uh, last year, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Nigeria, uh, 
Benin, uh, Cameroon. I mean, there have been serious uh, accusations of uh, of uh, possible rigging or interference in the election results. Even even today, when the or I think it was yesterday when the results of the presidential elections in Malawi were declared. I mean, there was uh, immediate uh, discussion that the opposition candidate did not accept uh, the result and there were already court cases. So uh, this, uh, this kind of consistency uh, is, is very important. And also uh, related to that, the, the constitution indeed, because we also see all around uh, or in many parts of Africa discussions about constitutions which were quite uh, dramatically uh, transformed in early 90s. Now there has been discussion whether the terms of the president can be lengthened and, uh, and powers have been concentrated to the hands of the, of the executive. But, uh, but I think that uh, Africa is still uh, uh, has potential to go to the uh, to the good direction. If we look at the global trends, uh, the democratization has has uh, has uh, uh, is seen uh, serious setbacks uh, in Europe, in the U.S., uh, in 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 uh, in much of uh, Latin America. But uh, in Africa, we, we can see that it's maybe not progressing as much as in previous years, but there is no that kind of uh, uh, turn. And uh, I think that these are very critical times in order to keep this uh, uh, belief in, in uh, political opening up and uh, accountability of the rulers. and. Uh, and uh, people's uh, participation in the elections. Um, South Africa also has an uh, important role in the African Union, for instance. I mean, African unions, the principles of African Union on, on uh, free and fair elections and, uh, and uh, respect for constitutions are uh, very good ones. So if the member states of the African Union are committed to those uh, values, uh, then we can safeguard uh, the uh, trends. And, um, and that's, of course, also uh, something that the international community can support. And uh, just a comment of the results of the elections. Uh, we, we can, of course, see that the support of uh, ANC is not like it has been previously, and, uh, and maybe we can then hear more and discuss about the reasons behind that, all those uh, corruption scandals, etc. But I think that uh, the overall picture now is maybe a bit more healthy than it has been previously, because uh, 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 57, 56, 57 percent of the, uh, of the support it's still a strong support, but maybe the party is not so dominant. So maybe there is now uh, now uh, opposition that is uh, creating uh, checks and uh, and balances for the party politics uh, as as well. Okay, this is some of the technical aspects. I thought before, uh, Magnus, we start with a, a okay. discussion. We, sh we should now we have had a careful start. So I ask Henning to come in now to give a more, uh, given historic, perhaps a short historical background to the present situation. Perhaps a more, less careful. Thank you. <laughs> Let me uh, first explain why there is no black voice on uh, sharing the analysis. We, we tried to, and one of our colleagues uh, from Zambia was supposed to join us, but she is not able to join us here. So. It's not that we didn't think about it or not tried uh, to bring in black voices, just if you're wondering, uh, at least it's a gender balance, but it lacks some other uh, multiple voices. Um, but we tried. Um, 
I think the ANC as a liberation movement as government shows some wear and tear, but not as much as some has predicted. When it comes to the voter turnout, I would like to add something because it should not be measured against the 65% of the registered voters. There were an estimated 12 million voters who did not bother to register. And they were mainly from the younger generation. So if you add them, and there was someone doing the arithmetics just yesterday, then the voter turnout, that's different from the Swedish system. You have to be registered as a voter that you can go to a polling station and cast your vote. You don't get your paper and, and have to do nothing. And 12 million didn't bother to register as voters. If you take them into the balance, then the voter turnout was less than 50%. You could say, well, in the so-called best democracy of the US, it's even less uh, with a similar system. But just to keep in mind what looks still impressive with 65% looks less impressive when it comes to the real number and is a warning sign looking that there was a considerable amount of protest voters, the younger generation who said, we are not voting, mm -hmm. which was a protest vote. You even had uh, in the uh, in internet and Facebook campaigns to call for mainly younger generations as this medium of communication usually approaches to call for not registering or if you have registered not to vote. That's significant because I think it shows that as a liberation movement, the ANC has reached an expiry date mm -hmm. as other liberation movements. But if you compare it with Zimbabwe or even with uh, Mozambique or, or, or Angola where they need to have state organized terror to stay in power, the ANC does not have to apply that. As we heard, the elections have always been considered free and fair and none, there were a few minor complaints immediately during the election process. Someone said, oh, I could rub my ink away and could vote so and so many times. Those were minute complaints and none of the parties actually, as a matter of principle, challenged the election results. Mm. That's very important. So it means the ANC has again regained an absolute majority after eight absolutely awful years in government. Do not forget Ramaphosa didn't have a chance. The one year he did crisis management to keep the party together and he couldn't fight the corrupt elements because they hold almost still half of the ANC and he got a vote which gives him the benefit of the doubt. And that for me is the most striking feature. Yes, you had disgruntled votes, they went to the EFF, not as much as I would have assumed originally. Some of them in KwaZulu-Natal because of the regional uh, conditions went back, I would say, to the Inkata Freedom Party. Uh, the EFF did best in Limpopo and Northwest, where they have their main stronghold. But even Gauteng, where a lot of people said ANC will not keep the control in the provincial elections, because keep in mind, we had national parliamentary elections and provincial elections. It was like that, that they kept Gauteng. But even with that minor success, no one said these were rigged elections. Um, so basically, yes, the Freedom Front got a number of uh, disgruntled voters from the Democratic Alliance who went there. I would say it's not worrying on both sides. It's a pattern which we observe in Sweden, if I may say. We observe in most of the countries that voted in the EU elections that a number of voters move away from the dominant parties and go either to the left or to the right. South Africa is just not very different, but I think altogether it was a vote for social stability and a vote that allows Ramaphosa, so to say, a mandate to, Ram to Ramaphosa, okay now, you multi-dollar millionaire, now please deliver. Okay, that's what we are going to speak. Are you, you think you have said about history as enough? on this.
you can come back later. Magnus. Um, you know, my, my point was also that the South Africa that I learned to know, which was extremely politicized, uh, conscientized with very organized population, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I, I think we should be happy that we have a democracy, yes. And we have uh, uh, the fulfillment of, of the liberation movement of uh, scrapping apartheid and introducing democracy. But we also have a, a very, very unequal society. A better life for all was the ANC promise uh, from 94. And uh, during some years we saw statistics showing that uh, poverty was decreasing. But the last couple of years poverty has, what I know, uh, according to that statistics, been increasing again. again. And I think that is also uh, <laughs> one reason for that so many of the young people, uh, I think it was the, the figures I saw that the six out of the 10 million that, uh, that didn't vote uh, were, were young people. And I think that's, uh, that's a sad story. Um, and. Uh, uh, we also can read about uh, uh, inefficiency and corruption in different parts of the country where uh, police reported in 2018, uh, I think it was 112 uh, incidents where the police has to go in uh, to take action, uh, some kind of uh, police action to stop various protests. Uh, and that's... Uh, signals of a dissatisfaction uh, which I think uh, uh, can lead to a lot of things in the future. Uh, we already see tendencies of uh, xenophobia uh, and uh, populism uh, and I think that the, this should be taken very seriously. If you want to uh, you, you, you explain how the election process now is, still is working very well. Uh, what about uh, and the constitution, as we, as you said, is one of the probably one of the best constitutions mm. in Africa, but also very comparative with the best in the world. How is is implementation when it comes to other rights uh, with, uh, within the constitution? I mean, the election you said works uh, quite well still. I need to think about this and I need to be very, very careful indeed yeah. because I am absolutely schooled as an ex-official from the Electoral Commission not to express any view that might be considered political in any way at all for fear of either enfranchising or disenfranchising a party and as a result I have to always temper my my responses with that paradigm because it's very easy to make a statement that can be considered to be political in one way or another. Uh, in general terms, my own personal experience was that my rights, certainly from an elections perspective, were protected. Broader than that, I would be hesitant to make a public statement on, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm overly cautious, perhaps, yeah. for No, but it's right, the because, because you are, mm. you, by being an official and, and, a head, and actually uh, senior, senior official of IDEA, you have to be careful. I can understand that. Mm. But uh, then, perhaps, Lisa, you can comment on that? Yes, yes. Uh, yes uh, well, I think that this uh, apathy of the young voters and uh, cynicism is uh, is a very serious concern, because that can, can really... Uh, ruin the legitimacy of the political system. And uh, we have now the, the recent uh, reports of Afroparometer, which is making uh, surveys on, on the values of, uh, of, uh, of citizens in, in several African countries, is showing that, uh, that although a majority of Africans still support protection of individual freedoms, uh, the support has declined and, uh, and uh, uh, a substantial number of citizens also in South Africa are willing to consider trading freedoms to greater security. So issues related to everyday life uh, security, I mean the, uh, the uh, threats of uh, violence, whether political or criminality, 
are things that people are uh, worried about. And, uh, and I think that uh, indeed the, the uh, making the uh, political system participation significant for young people is, is a real challenge for not only for ANC but the other parties too. Any? After we were so positive, let me just recall some basic facts. South Africa is the country with the highest Gini coefficient in the world. That is the, the method to measure the inequality in a society. That means uh, the difference between those with the least income and that with the highest income is the highest in the whole world. South Africa is no rainbow nation. The racial divide, at least based on my observations, uh, is deeper now than it was 25 years ago when everyone celebrated their desire to become a rainbow nation. But what we have witnessed in the 25 years is a pact among elites. A new black elite has joined an old privileged white elite at the expense of the ordinary living conditions of the people in the townships. Every time you visit South Africa, be it Cape Town, or, or Atambo, in Cape Town it's more obvious, the shacks are growing. They are not reduced, they are growing. That's not a good ground for people that makes them more democratic or civilized in the sense of peace. The dilemma is, and reference was made to the progressive nature of the South African constitution, it's basically the only constitution in the world which has clauses that include social and economic rights. The ordinary people in South Africa are entitled to social and economic rights, but a government faces the problem that it cannot deliver. While there is rule of law, and you can bring complaints to the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Court has several precedent cases ruled where the government needs to provide housing. In the case of HIV AIDS, uh, it ruled the government has to deliver entry retrovirals. The government has to deliver free water for those who cannot pay for it. The same with, uh, with uh, electricity. But the Constitutional Court at the same time in the ruling says the task is for the government to find a way to deliver. We cannot force them to deliver in the absence of having the means. And that is the dilemma which was actually reinforced through what has been called state capture when the ordinary people in the rural areas and more so in the townships witness a predatory kleptocratic regime which steals whatever they have access to and the ordinary people have to pay the bill. And coming back to my first uh, statement, I think this is where Ramaphosa is expected to deliver and make up for the eight lost years. If he can, that's a big question, but I think that is at the moment uh, the, the challenge. And that's where the young people say, we wait and see. We have no reasons to trust. As born freeze, that you liberated us from apartheid. No, you didn't liberate us. We grew up without apartheid. It does, it's not, we measure you against what you deliver. And what you delivered the last 10 years or so was absolutely lousy. So now let's see if you improve. Magnus. Um, and I, I think that also looking back how Cyril came to this position at the ANC Party Congress, uh, uh, it was a kind of a deal uh, at the Party Congress where at least uh, half of the national executive and half of the six top uh, have been accused of uh, having relatives or family who have benefited from the uh, Suma Gupta uh, business. So that is still there and um, 
it's very, I'm very doubtful that the, as long as those people are still around, uh, that uh, Ramaphosa will have the uh, strength uh, and the capacity to to uh, uh, deal with the state capture. Uh, we have seen some uh, commissions, and the most hopeful thing is what happened quite recently uh, with the new leadership of the National Prosecuting Agency. If that will get teeth and will be able to... Uh, act, then I'm hopeful. The problem is that the, the police on the lower levels uh, maybe are not interested and maybe not have the capacity, uh, investigative, etc. So um, it's very, I think it's very problematic. But I also think that one has to look a bit deeper uh, how uh, it's not just a matter of, of individuals uh, I think it has a history of, uh, of we saw a, a culture which grew <laughs> within the party of uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, you should make money. Uh, uh, Suma said, C come to ANC and be rich uh, when he talk was talking to a businessman. Uh, and uh, uh, Cyril is not a good example. In that. 400 million US dollars. Yeah. Uh, and uh, very, um, how should I say it? excessive uh, interest of uh, uh, selling um, livestock uh, buffaloes etc on, on for millions of, of rands just last year and marikana yeah and marikana plus that uh, but i'm um, talking about the, the culture of of uh, it's okay to use your political position uh, to make money uh, that is something which haven't been dealt with uh, and that's i think is a huge um, ideological and moral uh, problem for the for the party and for the state. Lisa, you mentioned aero barometer. Uh, are there specific data also in South Africa? Eh? No. Yes, yes, yes. Also, you, there the the uh, appreciation of freedoms has uh, has slightly gone down. But uh, South Africa, we just uh, looked at those graphs. South Africa is quite in the middle of uh, all African countries and what uh, something that these kind of uh, measurements show is the variety within Africa. The, the, there are big uh, differences uh, between African countries, but also in Africa the, the political freedoms are not uh, as much uh, respected. And uh, well, now there is a young generation who who have not experienced apartheid, but who have experienced uh, the ruling of uh, of the uh, of the dominant party, and uh, who have read about all those scandals and rumors. Okay, now I think we have heard uh, quite a lot about the problems and challenges, and I think also some figures on on on. In particular, I think what is is important is that youth are not. Uh, yeah, they don't really participate in 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 the in the political uh, system. But do you know, allow me a quick comment? Yeah, but I, I think that I now want to turn a little more <laughs> because it becomes very very bleak if we continue oh. with more. Okay, you give a good example here. I try not to be bleak. You have to look at the options. Is Malema the alternative? The Democratic Alliance will never be the alternative. It's still considered a white party. Look at the reports today about Malema. Yeah. So, what are the options? If you are willing to cast your vote in South Africa today, what are the options except giving Ramaphosa, despite all the reservations, the benefit of the doubt? That's the point. What else? Um, and that's a vote for stability. The people did not vote for the EFF, not in the numbers some predicted. Uh, the few whites who leave the DA for the Freedom Front, well. And I think in that context, it's just important. And you're right, SUMA is a system. And that's where Ramaphosa has to walk a tight line and a balancing act. It's one of the reasons why he hasn't appointed a cabinet yet is desperately, according to reports, look at it from the positive side, desperately trying to limit 
the damage a sumafaction can uh, bring in that cabinet. Mm. But he cannot risk that they divide the party to an extent that they opt out. So he has to act as a party president while he is also the head of state. And that is really a tricky thing. But the positive thing is, what would be the alternative? So what should he do? Do you dare to say something on that? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not. I, but I will say that I think, um, and I agree with the 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 statement perhaps that the the issue of racial identity has not been addressed within South Africa and it still runs very deep and there is uh, a significant amount of more work that needs to be done there but I do sense and and here I'm talking perhaps on a on a more personal level knowing a lot of South Africans and having lived there for so long. Um, that there is still a willingness within the general population to engage and to look forward and to build and to try and work together to to find a way to create a better life for all. I don't think that in South Africa people have given up to quite the extent that the bleak picture may may be presenting. I think there is still a willingness to be positive and to work to the future. I think though, and, and you're talking about the, the inequality index, the challenges are significant and there needs also to be some level of realism about what can be achieved in what time frames. Nobody's got a magic wand and you don't turn the Titanic on a a ticky, a two and a half cent piece. It's got a wide turning circle. There's uh, there's work that needs to be done, sure, but uh, it's going to take potentially quite some time before some of these things will bear real fruit. Yes, I think that is <laughs> a more optimistic way of <laughs> expressing it. Yes, you want to comment on that? At least, I mean, I, 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 yes, of course, there are. Uh, uh, hopeful signs and there are a lot of organization, the youth organizing different ways, the communities organizing in different ways and I think that of course that is hopeful uh, I'm, I'm just uh, and I think that without Ramaphosa uh, I think that the ANC risked to go under 50% uh, so there is a sense of we have to give Ramaphosa a chance and uh, a willingness to support uh, the ANC as a party uh, because of him, I should say. But then it's another thing to, to be a bit realistic and, and uh, knowing how the situation is uh, within the party uh, and what to do. I mean, there are some people who argue that uh, uh, Ramaphosa should do like Zuma, ignore the NEC and, you know, do his own thing as a president. Uh, but that will split the party and I don't think that he's interested of, of that. Uh, right now, I was reading about the dogs of war within the national executive uh, before the appointment of, uh, of a new cabinet. And there is uh, this integrity uh, committee within the party who has a list of uh, uh, 20 people uh, who have, uh, that are flagged as improper to represent the party. Uh, and they are now uh, wetting those and those people are answering to, to the party. Uh, so it's an uh, extremely heated uh, uh, debate and process within the party right now. Uh, and we should be, it should be extremely interesting to see the cabinet when it's presented, who are there and who are not there. Yeah, the timing is now is extremely exciting. But Magnus, what is the alternative? Uh, I mean... I don't have an alternative. Uh, I'm just saying that I'm happy that there is an enormous a lot of people, organization, who's trying to organize themselves. Uh, but uh, I'm just trying to be a bit neutral uh, to say that uh, the party itself uh, has a huge problem because it's so, uh, so many people who are, uh, have been pointed out for uh, corrupt practices uh, in different forms, family, etc. People that you, that I was extremely surprised to see uh, when it has been exposed. Uh, and the reason for this is that we have a free press. 
uh, and that we should be happy for, uh, which uh, uh, exposed this state capture. I think it was through a computer that uh, uh, ended up uh, wrongly, where a lot of uh, the documents from Gupta was exposed in media. Lisa, any comments on this? Yes, well, uh, media and uh, free press is, uh, is indeed uh, something that uh, where, where South Africa is also an important example for other, other uh, African countries. But this, uh, the role of media also re uh, relates to education, I mean, general education and, and uh, civic education and... Uh, one worrying issue is the uh, the performance of uh, schools at the moment in 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 Africa. I mean the 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 figures of uh, of young people without proper kind of basic skills in reading, writing, and calculating is uh, is quite dramatic. Although the kids are going to the school, they are not properly learning. So this is uh, the crisis of education is certainly also something that might explain uh, partly also about the apathy of, of, of young people if if uh, if they are pro if the society can provide proper kind of uh, basic education and there is a, uh, uh, the, there is a uh, vivid uh, civil society associational life I think that there are potential for for people to organize and to make the party accountable uh, through through the party organizations and uh, maybe also as I said uh, earlier I think that uh, even though it might be that um, none of the opposition parties is a real alternative that they are a bit more stronger I think it it makes uh, ANC maybe more, it, it's maybe forcing ANC to be more transparent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the, at the district or provincial level, uh, there are also uh, uh, settings where the opposition is quite strong. Henning, when will we know? Uh, how long time will it take for uh, Cyril Ramaphosa to, to show that he is able to tackle some well, of these problems. The first uh, indicator everyone is waiting for is the cabinet. Um, there are two aspects to that. Uh, it's expected that he will drastically reduce the number of portfolios and deputy ministers, which also means you don't continue a co-optation strategy. You bring everyone in that they are not becoming an enemy of you. He will stop that. That's at least what he uh, announced. That's the first step. And then, of course, the interesting thing is who will then survive. If you have a leaner cabinet and much less uh, deputy ministers, who are the ones who remain in cabinet or are brought into the cabinet or as deputy ministers? So that is something we can expect the next days to come. And the media will go berserk about analyzing who made it, who did not make it. The next is the next NEC, the National Party Executive Committee, meets at the weekend. And the assumption is the cabinet is then in place, and what will happen at the NEC? Uh, because they are waiting as much as we, what is the composition of the cabinet? Will that be the night of the long knives? Um, the next issue is how serious is the prosecution of SUMA? While SUMA is a system, it is significant symbolically if he does not get away with the fraud and organized crime he committed. That is a major signal. Also to the SUMA faction in the party. But as I said before, he is faced with a tremendous balancing act. Uh, since he is elected, he is a very weak party president. Uh, as you said, the ANC leadership is half-half. Uh, 
as a party president, he can't afford the divide of the party, that the party falls apart. And that impacts on the policy on the national level. So I think he'll try step by step. There were a few indications which are interesting. When Ace Masakule was pro grilled in the public as the most corrupt provincial governor, the ANC did not come to his defense. And everyone said, what is going on? Because the first reaction would be the party protects someone. He's the deputy president, I mean, of the party. No, they left him out in the cold. But they didn't protect the serial leader. No, that's true. But that's, of course, where everyone now reads in the coffee. Is this a sign of going against them? Is this a sign of retracting? And maybe you read signs in both ways. It is this balancing act. So it's very difficult to predict. I think what for me seems clear, if he manages, the ANC will stay in power. If he doesn't manage, I'm not sure if they get another absolute majority in the next elections, because the people had enough. If he goes too far, that's the one thing I can't judge and I'm afraid of. Let's not forget, while we praised South Africa, ever since democracy, political assassinations continue on a daily basis. In the Orange Free State, in KwaZulu-Natal, in Limpopo, in Northwest, you name it, we have within the ANC power struggles which result in planned executions of competitors. So South Africa is not as peaceful when it comes to politics, like for example Namibia. Um, it's important to note because that is my fear when I think about it and then I stop thinking further. If there is a tipping point where the Suma faction says that is enough, what are they able to mobilize? I don't know, but okay, that would that, be my that, fear. It's enough with, I, I just wanted to know when will we know? What I, okay. Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, most exciting uh, perspective, which is not related to maybe directly uh, uh, what happened in the ANC top leadership, is the National Prosecuting Agency. If they got a new leadership, if they get power, if they get resources, uh, and they have been indicated that they will not shy away from anything, uh, uh, and there is a lot of material already exposed about uh, uh, ACE uh, uh, and some of the other leaders within the uh, party leadership. Uh, the uh, justice system can solve it, so to say. Uh, and then uh, the these old uh, um, corrupt people uh, who came to, into power with, with the under Suma years uh, might not stay, and they would be picked, not of political negotiation, but one by one by the justice system. Mm. And that, I think, is the most, and it will not happen tomorrow, but, but it might be uh, even more significant uh, than, than, than the Suma case, uh, because the Suma case is still uh, so much tainted by uh, political uh, uh, they have already made compromises in that trial, which is, I think is not uh, acceptable uh, of people who have been let off the hook, etc. Uh, 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 but it's also something which is going on right now, and of course it has an impact, uh, uh, but it's very small money. We're talking about a half a million a, a year for, for Zuma, compared to the, uh, the big arms deals where there were money of 1.3 billion uh, so, uh, but there is a discussion also if uh, Suma is pressed too much uh, that he will spill the beans on the ANC as a party uh, because I think that the majority of those 1.3 billion uh, and I read the court case uh, documents which has been accepted by the court uh, uh, you're talking about 
possibly I would say estimate about one billion that went to the ANC as a party uh, when they was building up their own investment bank in a few years time. Uh, they were bankrupt and then they had an investment bank and I'm, I'm convinced and I've been speaking to senior NEC members who admit this as well that this um, money went to the ANC uh, to build up an own uh, capital and investment bank. Chans you, Chans you, you say they, about judiciary and that uh, they would be, be able to prosecute. Is the judiciary system stable enough, strong enough to, to be able to handle these cases? I mean, the question mark is that the police are, 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 uh, are able to make investigations which are, are solid enough. Uh, but with the new political leadership and national prosecuting agency, I think that uh, uh, there are hope. Uh, we should also remember that the NEC uh, dis took decision of closing down the most efficient uh, police investigating unity scorpions after a political decision because it's, it threatened them. And in that, uh, Mbeki and Suma and the whole NEC was agreed because they didn't want to have an effective investigative uh, police, uh, which is, I think, was a real shame that they did that. But I'm, I'm hopeful now. Uh, I, it's, uh, uh, it's such a strong signals that they are willing to, to tackle on uh, and do follow up and prosecuting uh, uh, cases in relation to the state capture. Okay, uh, what you are saying is that we have had eight years of very serious uh, uh, problems and that uh, after this election there is hope but uh, it, it, it requires quite considerable uh, political will and, and, and uh, risk taking. And we will not really. We we might know quite uh, quite a lot of things already very soon. But really, I mean, the cha real changes will take some time because it would require that that institutions will be created and will work well, like the pro prosecutor. One aspect which I think is interesting that it was uh, looking at the party. So many of the uh, veterans and experienced people basically left the party. Uh, they couldn't stand uh, uh, or didn't get positions uh, or deliberately left party under the Zuma. But uh, uh, I understand that the, the, uh, the ministers and Ramaphosa himself have appointed various kind of committees where a lot of the old um, experienced political leaders are now going back to the party and, and supporting with their skill in various advisory committees. I don't think it has been written very much about this, but I think it's quite an interesting development. And I think it's a positive one. Okay, I think we open up, I mean, we, we have quite some time still, but uh, I think we open up for some questions and some comments. And Tandika, I think I want to hear your comments first. Are they too pessimistic? You know, everyone knows Tandika, Makandavire professor and, and uh, perhaps one of the best uh, 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 <coughs> statskunskap professor, politi uh, political uh, scientist. Uh, from honorary rock doctor of the University of Helsinki. <laughs> hmm. Please. Well, I, I'm not sure whether one should call it pessimistic or... Uh, I think that... Uh, I just read the paper which came out on, on Zimbabwe uh, where I was looking at this remarkable transitions that the country had in a, in a period of 20 years. They had to go through democracy, they had to have land reform, they had to have structural adjustment, they had, and that you know, the country just had a, a transition overload towards the end. Just, just too many transitions going on. We suspended quite a number of transitions. Uh, we talk about a good constitution, for instance, uh, and yet in, embedded in that constitution is uh, laws that prevent reforms in other areas. So it's, it's a, uh, you, or you have a good financial sector, but at the same time it's, got, it's constrained in democratic processes. So there are a lot of things that are good, which have been held. And I think, if you 
Well, I think what happens in Africa is that a number of those postponed transitions will come to haunt them. There are just too many postponed transitions. And, and so you, you can either go to Zimbabwe and have all of them in 20, in 20 years and grows up. Or you can, you can have one transition going on. And, and we wonder why the young people are withdrawing. It could be that maybe the transition that affects them has been suspended. So they have no interest. And, and, and that's why I say that, and that I think we, we should see that as a case of multiple transitions. And we just have to decide why have they chosen to, to, you know, to go to make some transitions and not others. Whether that's so pessimistic or optimistic, I don't know. But I think that's just a question of uh, opening up the fact that they are trapped in a situation where, where they, have, they have to carry on a number of transitions on race, on inequality, on democracy, on the economy, on even land issue. This whole bunch of things have to resolve. Right? It's not pessimistic, it's explanatory. Okay, the floor is open. Please, can you tell... Hey, Marlene, how are we going to do with... I'm solving the problem. You are solving the problem, okay. <laughs> Speak out and tell your name, because we are recording it. Okay, brilliant. Nick, I'm from South Africa. I'm studying a Master's in Politics here. Um, and loosely affiliated with the Nordic Africa Institute, I spent some time there. Um, so I can attest to the brilliance of my colleagues on stage. Um, I do have a few sort of comments, um, like sort of drawn out throughout the presentation. Um, so we spoke about the sort of uh, this huge apathy of the youth not going to the polls and. Uh, I think that that's obviously quite worrying, but there's a substantial of like sort of percentage of non-voters who um, a lot of research has indicated that they are being not apathetic towards politics, but re like restraining their vote as a sort of a punishment towards the ANC. Not necessarily as a punishment, but sort of withdrawal of that as a way to sort of take a step back and see what happens. Um, and then there's, of course, people who deliberately have spoiled their votes, and that, uh, I think, there was a, a report that came out that it showed that it would have been the fourth or fifth largest party in South Africa, if spoiled votes would have been a, a political party, which is astronomical. Um, Henning, you said that it's not worrying that these fringe parties have uh, gained so much traction politically, and I think um, that it is worrying. I mean, obviously, it's very nice to have high levels of democratic competition, um, and it's wonderful that you get that vibrant spirit within a political process. But the parties that have won are very much parties that are um, drawing heavily on race politics and ethnicity politics within their campaigns. So, central, like strong parties like the ANC have obviously taken a knock, the DA has taken a knock. Um, and worryingly, you've got, I'm not saying they're terrible parties, but a lot of their campaigns have been based off racial divides, ethnic divides. You see the Frey Hates Front Plus with Afrikaner nationalists going directly towards them after they've seen the DA not looking after their interests. You've got the IFP, who's managed to like gain a huge amount of uh, traditionally Zulu voters. You've got... Um, Al Jama something as an Islamic party that for the first time has got parliamentary seats. Um, and these parties have, have very much heavily played up this divide. And I think that's worrying um, because South Africa has managed to relatively avoid that sort of politics for the time being, where you've seen it sort of permeate throughout the, uh, you know, the Western world. Um, you also spoke of the extremely high Gini coefficient. Um, it's also important to note, I think, that from 1994, it was also one the highest Gini coefficient in the world. There aren't uh, statistics on it, but the divide was even worse then. Um, so to say that, um, oh, it's so bad because there's this, this huge inequality, of course it's bad. 
but it's been bad historically for a long time. And you also mentioned the sort of nine lost years of the Zuma era. And that, um, I mean, like, I think it's important to differentiate those nine years to the ANC's performance previously. So from 94, you've had a party that's proven to be very competent, that's, you know, delivered a huge amount, that's made giant leaps in terms of addressing inequality, provision of services, uh, to people who've had nothing before. Um, and I agree, there's been a sharp decline in that over the last nine years, and there's a lot of ground to make up because of that loss. Um, but I would say, and I mean, you spoke of a, what's the alternative. I mean, we don't need an alternative. What we have now with uh, Ramaphosa-led government, um, able and mandated to sort of affect the change that he's openly spoken about and the needs that the country uh, has, I think, is, you know, an incredibly brilliant thing. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I would take it as a hugely optimistic step. Okay, good to balance. Any, we take a few more questions if there are. Yes, please. My, um, this is, I'm from Namibia, Nigeria, and I'm very much interested in the southern African <coughs> politics. I have been active politics in Namibia. And Namibia and South Africa, we are facing the same problems. Mm -hmm. And what I see, the youth empathy, I think this contradiction between the politicians takes democracy and they take the African culture of being an elder. When the children, when the youngsters are talking to them, it's like they are talking to people in their own houses, like they are talking to people in their house, in their, their family, they demand respect, whereby the children are not really disrespectful, but they are just trying to voice their unhappiness. But I think that within the ANC, within this liberation movement, those kind of, it's, it's not allowed. It is where have you been? We fought for this country. We, we did, you were not, you should not say anything. I think that is also contributing to the empathy of the youth because they don't really see their future into this liberation movement. They, they are been sidelined. You either have to be just to say a yes boy, you are not allowed to voice your unhappiness. And in Namibia we have the youth who were expelled from the party. And I don't know the ANC if there are any difference. I think they are all in the same direction. They are all doing the same thing. And then the other thing about Ramaphosa being getting that 57% in my view, I think it could be that he is from the minority tribe. The other, he's not from one, it's a consolidation within the ANC. Because we have the same issue in Namibia to have Hagen Enko, who is from the minority group, to try to consolidate within Swako, to have tribes to be able to work together. I think the ANC is almost in the same, in the same direction. Okay, thank you. Any more? Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking that there have been improvements under Zuma, and I suspect that these improvements have come because they've been set in place by previous governments, and that it was not possible for Zuma and his people to withdraw in the way Ace Mahashule did and many others did from Central, the central points. I just quickly like to point out 58% of the people in 96, in other words, two years after the first democratic um, government, had electricity. 2016, 20 years later, 90.3% had it. 60% had piped water households in 96, 83, nearly 84% 20 years later. 
Uh, when it comes to flush toilets, there's no data, but today there are about 61% of households that are flush toilets, which is amazing, considering how many people are desperately poor, how many people are living in the shacks and in the, uh, in the country. 61% of flush toilets. Assuming these data, this data is correct, but it's official. However, and this is the important thing, and this is the point that Henning and a number of people have made. Since um, in the past 10, since 2010, in other words, since just after Zuma got power, the income per head has fallen. And we know where it's gone, into private pockets and overseas. Billions and billions and billions. However, before we put this to bed, there is a 10, the wealth of the wealthiest households is 10 times that of the poorest households. Now this is all official statistics, statistics of that. 10 times. This is your genius coefficient. Okay, now we have quite a few questions to comment on. Imanus, you have waved your hand. Yeah, well, I was just thinking of uh, apathy or uh, that it is more of a protest, uh, not people are not participating and voting and uh, register. I think that uh, if there is thought on or statistics on that or investigations on that, it sounds uh, very promising. Uh, so uh, that I think that's very interesting. Uh, you also mentioned the, the, the uh, racial language of, of from, from other parties, uh, Freedom Front and others. But I, I would say that uh, I've been quite surprised to also hear racial language within the ANC, uh, which were, were not being possible uh, earlier, I say. So that, there we see a change. Also language about immigrants taking our jobs and taking our health resources, etc. Um, um, I referred earlier to poverty statistics uh, uh, that indicated that poverty was declining uh, for a number of years, but has been increasing uh, during the last couple of years. Uh, and I think that I, I feel very skeptical of when you say, Mavi, that uh, in 2016, 90% of the household having electricity. I mean, looking at the, the squatter camps uh, on the, all the huge areas, people uh, who live in, in shacks. Uh, I, I, so I'm, I'm very curious to find out. Mm -hmm. the electric lights, mm -hmm. wires going, it's to prevent mm -hmm. fires. But uh, I would also say that uh, uh, you can compare different statistics, uh, and I agree with, with the, I think a lot of resources is going out from the country. Uh, I think that the researchers are also indicating that, a huge amount of money, capital flight. But there is also the statistics of the research that, says, that say that uh, about a third of the whole economy is lost through corruption, <coughs> estimation. A third of the whole economy. So that's huge uh, effects on the economy. More comments? Lisa? Well, well uh, just a, a, a comment on the, on the significance of uh, identities, race, and uh, even, even religion in the, in the elections. Uh, uh, it's interesting because, of course, it's not only South Africa. I mean, this is we are we are seeing how the old uh, left-right party systems are fragmenting, even in the EU elections. And uh, look at look at Britain, for instance. So, it would be interesting to see if uh, if the apathy of the young people is uh, is partly a. Uh, political organization, Henning said that there were Facebook uh, groups also uh, motivating young people not to vote. So what kind of alternatives are there? Uh, is there going to be uh, movements for environmental issues, for instance? Uh, is there going to be uh, mobilization for South Africa's role in whole of Africa or in the world? Uh, is there also uh, this kind of uh, ideologies to to go more inside and uh, 
uh, uh, close the borders as we have we have political parties here in the north whose main political message is to close the borders as, and xenophobia was already mentioned as, as one of the issues. So I think that we have to be sensitive for new kind of uh, political mobiliz mobilization and, uh, and the alternatives. And I, I really would like to emphasize the importance of uh, education for, for young people. And uh, that's, that's also the way to provide opportunities to employment, uh, entrepreneurship uh, alternatives, maybe also to, uh, to um, uh, interact with uh, business opportunities uh, uh, with, uh, with other countries. So, Henning, before I give you the floor, no one has so far mentioned anything about, I mean, we talk about internal mishaps and, and uh, corruption for internal, but is there nothing to say about external influences over the past 10 years? See if you can add something on that. Well, the external influences were there ever since the democratic transition took place. Yes. Uh, it was a negotiated deal which basically handcuffed any effort uh, to go to profound transformation of society. In that sense, South Africa today has remained a product of external influences. Um, I don't want to get away cheaply with that remark, but it's important, of course, to keep in the back of your mind all the time. And one of the challenges Ramaphosa is, is facing is exactly that, to, be, to create uh, confidence again among potential investors, to create employment with hopefully a trickle-down effect, with a raise of salary, with creating employment, even if the major profits still are transferred or go into local pockets. So that will be a major priority in his policy. That's the stability vote, so to say. And in, in that sense, external influences guide politics from A to Z in South Africa. <laughs> and uh, they need to reconcile with the internal contradictions uh, through the protest moves that the effects of the external impacts have provoked among the people among the disappointment of the people, because that was, of course, one of the, the major handicaps. People thought democracy would bring material well-being. And the insight after 25 years is one cannot eat democracy. You can speak out and criticize that you have nothing to eat. That's democracy without being punished. But it doesn't help you in fighting the daily struggles for survival. That is a predicament. So as much as we applaud the liberal political culture in South Africa, as long as you do not deliver in material terms, it's very difficult for ordinary people to say, that doesn't matter, we live in a democracy. Um, so that's the one thing. And there the external factor comes into the picture. And I would like to see sophisticated external investment, which would reason along the lines, we contribute to stability by creating employment, investing, and in return we get a secure 5% profit margin for the next 30 years instead of making quick bucks in a great way for three years and then everything collapses. But you, cre you need to create that, that environment and that is very difficult. I would like to add, yes, identity politics comes into the picture as one of the responses to that. Not only in South Africa, as was mentioned, it's all over. It's in Namibia, it's in South Africa. Identity politics is one of the responses. And Identity politics also bringing into the picture ethnicity, not only black and white. It's, it's beyond that. It's, it's much more than just black and white. Um, but I know you a few, Mark, and that's, I basically saw you sitting there and I made that uh, emphasis because I knew you have another approach. That's why I wanted to say that. I still think the votes that illustrate identity patterns of voting. I personally find less worrying than you seem to do. The Western Cape, 
remains DA. I do not see, well, I haven't seen the, the proper analysis, but I don't see that the Muslims turned their back on the ANC and the DA. I don't see that. The same for the coloreds. They are not starting to vote for colored parties. So it's, we talk about margins. And that's where I would say, even if the margin gets bigger, the IFP is not back to what they had 20 years ago. So what are we excited or worried about? The IFP is not bigger than it was 20 years ago. It, yes, it's smaller, even if there is an increase. And the Freedom Front with that two plus percent. Come on, every forum was there all the time. Okay, some more who were disappointed by the DA now vote for the Freedom Front. It will not change the impact. I don't see that it has a major impact on the political discourse, on the conflicts. Every forum did all that already before. You don't need one more percent for the Freedom Front to make that point. So I, maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> I would not be as worried despite the fact that yes, there is a growing element of identity politics and the intergenerational divide is growing. But mind you, not only the protest non-voters. If you look at the Swapo Youth League and at the ANC Youth League, you find a tremendous radicalization in their ranks because they position themselves as the successors to the Tatikulus. It was the ANC Youth League that wanted to burn publicly in the Orange Free State this new book by the investigative journalist. And it was the ANC leadership who said, no, you don't. So that's another element we have to, to consider. But even that, as long as the leadership says, no, you don't, I think, OK. You have a chance for a few more questions. Yes? Yeah, um, my some of you know, I spent five years in the Swedish delegation in South Africa. Years as Swedish ambassador after apartheid. And when I came home in 2008, I was very often asked by people who know so much about Southern Africa um, if we had to be afraid that South Africa now under Zuma, because Zuma took over while I was in do we now have to be afraid that we will see a development that looks like Zimbabwe? And I put my chin out, or whatever you say in English, uh, during this, the, the year or so after I'd come back. I worked at the Africa Institute, by the way, during that period. Um, and said, I don't think so. And why not? Because the Constitution is there, the ANC is a proud and old organization with strong uh, leadership. Uh, it will sooner or later correct itself. Uh, within the limits, it will, it will not go all the way as, as it did in Zimbabwe. And it, it, what I couldn't see was that it would take so long. And I would just like to say, this has been very useful for me after so many years to, to hear what, is, what do you think you are following very closely now. And it's been very, a uh, very sophisticated uh, analysis that we've been getting. And, it may be simplistic, but it's interesting to think in terms, as, as many of you have done, of being optimistic or pessimistic. And I would like to join, as I was especially happy to hear the, in my, from my point of view, a relatively young South African scholar who is here in Sweden saying that, reminding us of what the ANC, where it comes from, and what it has provided after all. But I'd like to, to add one observation which I made. I, I have met a person who was in Tabo and Benkit's government, uh, who was one of those who left. And that person now, I asked that person, why are you not going back? Because you're needed. And the person said, uh, the second time I said that, which was just only two months ago, one month ago, I'm now talking to Cyril Ramaphosa about going back. He made probably that person was one of those who said, I'm not going to sit in government again uh, because I don't like that work, but I'm, I'll try to, to make my contribution. But that person said, and that's my final remark and point, said 
that the person had not realized, I'm trying to conceive whether it's a woman or a man, as you can hear. The person said uh, uh, that that person had not realized how far the corruption had gone. In other words, all the people that Suma brought in, almost all of them, had to be, agree to be corrupted or to be part of the corruption. And you can't. You can't uh, take 100% or fi even 50% of all these people who are there now and, and just throw them out without serious consequences. And, and you've talked about that in the panel. So it's, it's, I'd like to remain optimistic, but I'm also very nervous when I'm now going to listen to what the <coughs> is, is going to do. Let's try to be optimistic. And thank you for, for Marvel's presentation. Harry, did you want to say something? Yeah. No? <laughs> okay, I see no more. Yes. Um, I, I, know, I looked with horror at the AMC election list in the light of what you and Henning have been talking about, um, identity politics. The AMC reached in 94, we proudly had every other place was a woman. I'd be surprised if a third of the places today were for females. I think it was not even a quarter. The other thing is, I, let, I looked and looked and searched and searched for names that were not clearly black African. And I found only a handful. So that this problem with identity politics is rooted in the ANC today and it's new. And this is to be it's terrifying, and I'm quite sure that one of the reasons that the ANC has dropped is that a lot of the people who are preparing to give vote for Ramaphosa, I mean from who aren't black, who are pre prepared to vote for Ramaphosa in the hope that he would clean up the country's act, decided against it when they saw that list. Okay, I think we now take it. Yeah, wait a After you have given your point, oh, you take your final turn, then, then you all have a chance to, to say something. Yes, please. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of comment on that. Um, I, I haven't looked at the gender proportionality of the list, but I mean, the ANC is incredibly strong in its female representation in, in its parliamentary lists and its candidates within its ministries. Um, so I think they've done particularly well there. And also, I mean, we're, white people are a handful of the population, so I mean, it's not unheard of that they also are a handful of I said of none the African. I meant there were very few colored people's names okay. and very few Indian or Asian people's names. All right, fair enough. Um, but then on the point of, on that list in particular, is that for the first time you've had people who were on that list and getting sworn into parliament to sort of withholding the uh, swearing in uh, and delaying it in order to clear themselves from the integrity commission which i think is a huge positive step in terms of fighting corruption or at least uh, portraying the image of of maintaining high ethical standards and i mean Cyril's done a tremendous amount and taken, I think, a number of really positive steps in terms of rooting it out and um, sending it to the courts, which are incredibly, uh, I think, capable of and um, sort of well structured to, to deal with that. Okay, thank you. Now we take uh, you each the last word, and I will start with Magnus here this time. I think that uh, we, uh, I remember um, Cyril in one of his first speeches uh, made a very, I think, a very deliberate uh, reference to the ANC history uh, of also acknowledging other political parties, part of the history, uh, emphasizing the Congress of Democrats, etc. And I think that has been some signals, uh, because uh, that didn't occur during the, the, uh, the, the Suma years. I was also thinking of where the economy might have gone if uh, 
uh, we have seen the coalition of uh, Malema and uh, Ramaphosa. I think that that would have been a very difficult situation for for the the, the economy. Uh, I was also thinking of new challenges and new ways of, of organizing. In uh, Eastern Cape, there is a village. Uh, uh, you mentioning the political murders. Uh, I would say that there is a growing trend of uh, community activists uh, uh, being uh, killed, not just because of uh, political affiliation, but it's uh, a question of uh, land and resources, often linked to, to mining projects. In KwaZulu Natal, uh, there have been 12 murders in the last 16 months uh, near Richards Bay. In uh, I heard the other day uh, uh, this. Uh, um, Amadiba Crisis Committee in Eastern, Eastern Cape, how they were battling with the government uh, because they were so happy they got a constitution. Then they got a certain bill protecting the, the uh, Urfolket uh, and the, the local communities. But now there's a mining uh, bill which the government referred to, which basically takes away a lot of their rights from the constitution. Uh, but it's also positive because there is also people organizing themselves. So, so I think that is a, 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 a positive thing. Yep. Okay, Lisa? Yes, I, I also want to end with, uh, with positive remarks. I think the, the, the freedom of media is, uh, is very significant. Uh, the legal system, the very fact that these corruption scandals have been uh, revealed uh, and uh, I think that uh, South Africa can be an engine for whole of Africa. It's a, it's a continent of uh, young people and uh, a lot of uh, potential and, uh, and opportunities. It is, uh, it is also our responsibility to look at those uh, positive trends and uh, try to support it uh, as far as, as possible. We also know that uh, in the international system there are players who do not care so much about corruption or who are maybe ready to play with that kind of uh, rules. And, uh, and I think that it's also a responsibility of the international community to look at how the how the economic relations with uh, South Africa are built. But the resources are there and uh, the potential. Anything? I think that the change of leadership in the party in December 2017 and as head of state in February 2018 opened new space uh, with very little immediate effects but the political discourse changed. The naming and shaming is not against the ANC. It's addressed to a, albeit fragile, new leadership to say, do something about it. That is a change in the discourse. And I think that explains why the ANC maintained 57% of the votes, because people were willing not to entirely write off the old, new ANC, but say, we can ask. And prior to the elections, we had the letter of the elders who named and shamed the people on the electoral list of the ANC. 40 plus names where they said they should not be there. They are thieves. They are rapists. They are fraudsters. Now, legally, it was not possible to just withdraw them, but um, Mabusa was one of the effects that he did not attend the swearing in but that he did that extra round, maybe symbolically, that's something that needs to be weighed and seen, but before no one of them cared about symbolic gestures, the mere fact that the situation is that Mabusa says, I'm not sworn in when I should be, I first go to the disciplinary party committee and I'm sworn in as it happens this morning, I believe, maybe it's tokenism, but that tokenism wouldn't have existed a year before. I mean, so maybe it's more than that. Final, a personal remark. Identity politics is nothing new. And I talk about own experience as a white member of a black anti-colonial movement. Identity politics was always there. 
and for very obvious and understandable reasons. Why should there not be an identity politics when it comes to the individual differences in socialization, in access to privileges, starting with the color of your skin? Of course there is identity politics in Southern Africa and in other, especially former settler colonial societies, right at the roots since those societies were colonized. Of course, only that identity politics was not opportune. The few whites who joined the anti-colonial movement, they were the welcome token to say, we are a national movement, and in our ranks are whites, blacks, Indians, uh, coloreds, you name it. That has changed, and that change is now reflected. But it was there all the time. And we should accept it gracefully, or at least realistically, as part of the inherited legacy of colonialism. Fiona? Thank you. Um, I find myself, <coughs> as is uh, fairly commonly the case as a, a person who's worked for an electoral commission, uh, quite clearly on a political divide between those that may talk politics and me who may not. But So I'll, I'll close with some process issues, if I may, to talk about one of the issues raised, particularly around youth engagement, etc., and um, talk about some of the things that the Electoral Commission has been doing and is doing to try and... Um, engage better with the youth going forward and recognizing that uh, I'm not necessarily naive enough to say that these methods will necessarily address some of the root causes that uh, if they're accepted have perhaps been alluded to but there are um, routine registration drives to try and generally increase registration to address the gap between the eligible voters and the registered voters. There are also active um, community outreach campaigns in all sections of the community of, uh, through a variety of able, disabled, um, uh, various community groups, uh, faith-based institutions, etc., to try and attract voters. And particularly in relation to youth, one of the initiatives recently is uh, what we call Schools Democracy Week, where uh, we move into schools to try and instill the principles of civic responsibility because rights bring with them responsibilities and to run dummy elections and to try and stimulate interest at a, at a very young age. Um, so there I, I stand on the, the fairly dull process stuff, I'm afraid, and I'll pause there. Thank you. So thank you very much. So the question is, are we more clear about where is South Africa heading after the election? I think that at least we know, we have heard that it is a very important moment, that there are chances, that there are possibilities, that with a new leadership after the election, that there is a possibility to, to make a change. And probably not only is it an ability, it has to be, because otherwise uh, things will get much worse. So thank you very much for the panel. Traveling all the way from other places, and, and thank you for staying with us, coming here and staying with us. Thank you very much.